Greetings, everybody, and welcome to case study number 31. This will be a sluggish child. Okay, not an uncommon complaint. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button in the upper right hand corner. I appreciate all the contributions uh, that I can get very, very much. Um, and I thank all of you who have already donated. Uh, really helps offset the cost of producing these videos. Um, so as you know, I like to keep my videos free and I will always keep them free, uh, but I appreciate all the contributions I can get. So thank you very much in advance. Okay, we got a five-year-old African-American boy. This is a patient that I actually saw about a decade ago. So this is a real-life patient. He's coming in with his mom complaining of hyperactivity for the last three months. Mom says that his preschool teachers have noticed that he's not himself lately, and this includes poor attention, sluggishness, and occasional tantrums. Review of systems is otherwise unremarkable. Prenatal birth and postnatal history are uncomplicated. Patient mom recently moved in with his maternal grandmother as mom recently started a graduate program. Patient has no significant past medical history, no siblings. He's on no medications. He's tracking in the 60th percentile for weight and the 65th percentile for height. Very important when you're looking at a child coming in you want to know if you can find out you want to know if they're tracking if their percentile is tracking and by tracking what we mean is that they're staying around the same percentile you know um, they shouldn't be moving up percentiles and they shouldn't be moving down percentiles they should be tracking the same way so that's something you want to take a look at another thing uh, you look at your vitals here you've got to make sure that you're taking into consideration that this is a child Okay, so um, you will uh, need to know uh, that children tend to have lower blood pressures and higher heart rates. Um, so a normal heart rate for a child this age would be 80 to 120. So you look at his heart rate, it's 108. In an adult, we would call that tachycardia. In a child, no. Respiration's 22. Again, in an adult, we would consider that tachypnea. In a child, no, that's normal. 20 to 28 respirations per minute. Okay, um, so what are we going to consider now for our physical exam? We are going to look at this patient generally, and we see that he's got mild pallor. Sometimes difficult to appreciate in people of color, um, but, uh, you know, if you see people of color enough, you will get used to that. Uh, HENT shows conjunctival pallor, uh, but otherwise pretty normal. Chest and lungs, clear to auscultation, cardiovascular, gentle holosystolic murmur. This is likely an innocent murmur of childhood. Abdomen, okay. Tender, deep palpation. Liver and spleen not palpable, no distension, normal bowel sounds. But he's got this belly pain, so that's really interesting. So not only do we have a child with altered behavior or altered, even altered personality, if you want to call it that, he's got... Signs of anemia and belly pain. That's unusual. We would not expect that if we were dealing with just a regular old ADHD case. Non-focal neuro exam and normal mental status. So what are we going to consider for our differential? Well, you should be considering any of the possible causes of anemia. So iron deficiency anemia, nutritional deficiencies, and hemolytic anemia. Um, and there are other causes that you may consider too. Lead toxicity. Lead toxicity classically shows up with in children with behavioral changes. Um, they could have headaches. They can have belly pain. So it is something we need to consider. And then ADHD would kind of be a diagnosis of exclusion, although there are, in fact, uh, criteria that they would need to meet uh, to satisfy that diagnosis. So for our workup, because we're considering anemia, we need to not only do a CBC, but a CBC with smear. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just get iron studies on this patient right away, and I'll explain why that is. We'll get a BMP, we'll get an LFT, and that's because of the belly pain, and we'll get a serum lead level. That's going to be really important. So we find that he is, in fact, anemic. His hemoglobin is 7.5, hematocrit 23%. Uh, and when we look at the MCV, I should say that this is low. Uh, but when we look at the MCV, it is 74, in indicating a microcytic anemia. The smear confirms that, but we also see basophilic stippling. The serum iron is low. The TIBC is elevated, and the ferritin is low. That all points to an iron deficiency anemia. But that's not it. The lead level is high. So we have lead toxicity. 
So we have lead toxicity with a concomitant iron deficiency anemia, and that is very, very common to have iron deficiency when you have lead poisoning, and I'll explain why that is. The treatment for lead toxicity is chelation therapy. Now that will always be done on a patient if their lead level is 45 micrograms per deciliter or more. Uh, however, if they are symptomatic, we will always do chelation therapy. And as a matter of fact, if they're symptomatic, we need to kind of amp up the chelation. So if they're asymptomatic, 45 to 69 uh, micrograms, we will do PO succimer. If they are symptomatic or they are more than 70 micrograms, then we do dimercaprol, EDTA, and we need to admit them because this is intravenous therapy. We will also, in this patient, need to give supplemental iron. Now, in, for children, you can do these drops, which can be really nice. Um, I suppose you could do a, a, a you know, non-oral, um, like a, an intravenous preparation, um, but just make sure that you know you need to give this patient iron. We're going to consult poison control and notify the health department. Those are two things you need to do in lead poisoning. And then reassure, counsel the family, uh, try to figure out what the exposure was, and then uh, once the patient is discharged, repeat the serum lead level in one month. Lead poisoning occurs due to occupational or domestic exposure to lead, which could lead to lead toxicity. That is where you start to present with symptoms. The early symptoms are headache, abdominal pain, anorexia, constipation, and very common in children, behavioral changes. Once you start getting to higher levels, um, then you start to have neurologic symptoms. So they get clumsy, um, they start to get really, really fatigued, um, they might be throwing up, uh, and they can ultimately go into convulsions, coma, and death. The best initial diagnostic step when you consider lead poisoning is the serum lead level. So you need to order that. The best initial management is chelation therapy that will be done for any symptomatic patient or for a patient who is above at or above 45 micrograms. So if they're asymptomatic and above 45 to 69, uh, you'll just do PO succimer. If they are symptomatic or they are above uh, 70, then you will use dimercaprol, EDTA, and you'll need to admit them. You've got to make sure you try to identify the offending source. That's not something you're gonna be able to do on CCS. That's something you'll do in real life, but um, that's why the counseling the family is very important. You wanna to try to identify what probably happened here and what did happen in this patient was that he moved into an older home with his grandma. There was lead paint chips all over the place. Lead is very sweet tasting, so kids will eat that if they get a hold of it. They'll start chewing on things. Uh, so why do we get iron deficiency with lead poisoning? Well, keep in mind that iron and lead use the same transporters. So what that means is that if you have lead in the GI tract, it's going to compete with iron, and so you're not going to be absorbing iron, and so you'll get an iron deficiency. Another reason that you're going to get a microcytic anemia is because lead inhibits ferrochelatase. Remember, ferrochelatase is that last step in heme synthesis. And so you won't be able to make heme and therefore you'll get a microcytic anemia. That is also why we get that basophilic stippling. You're not able to make heme products. And so you're going to have iron that sticks around in the cells. Um, and that's what causes that stippling. Okay, now our differentials included anemia, iron deficiency anemia we did see in this patient. Uh, if it was isolated, obviously we would have normal lead levels. Nutritional deficiencies, B12 and folate deficiency tends to show a high MCV. And hemolytic anemia, you'd have normal lead levels, normal MCV, but you'd have an increased unconjugated bilirubin that would have shown up on the liver function tests. ADHD, you would not have anemia, you would not have belly pain, you would just have isolated behavioral changes. All right, so to recap, lead toxicity is due to environmental or occupational exposure to lead, variety of symptoms that we went over. Uh, the big ones, behavioral changes, anemia, and belly pain. Um, they can also get pica, but that's due to the iron deficiency. The best initial and most accurate diagnostic test is a serum lead level that is going to give you your diagnosis. The treatment is chelation based on whether they have symptoms and what their lead level is. You will always chelate if they're over 45 uh, micrograms. Uh, so 45 to 74 and asymptomatic, you will use succimer orally. And uh, sorry, that should be 70. Uh, if they're greater than 70, 
then you will use Dimer Caprol and EDTA that will uh, require an admission. Make sure to evaluate for other causes of anemia and treat that too, specifically iron deficiency anemia. So getting those iron labs, uh, if you're suspecting lead poisoning, uh, that is something that you should just get on your initial workup. And then follow the patient up in a week with a repeat serum lead level.